right. If you have your Bibles, would you open them, please, to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. We're going to finish the second chapter of Colossians today, Lord willing. Colossians, chapter 2. And we're going to pick up in verse 3 for a springboard text in case somebody has not been here for all the series or somebody listening on the uh, internet has not been here for the, the series. Just kind of just give it a springboard for the next thoughts because uh, they're very uh, demonstrative. The thoughts that Paul's projecting here are very practical. And, we, and I want to look at them, but we have to have this background before we can understand what Paul's uh, messages to us would be. So beginning in verse 3. It says, of Jesus Christ, in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We're getting this picture of completeness in Jesus Christ. We need to see that. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, that we need something other than Jesus Christ. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in the spirit. Paul says, I'm not writing Colossae right now, but I'm there with you, I'm concerned about you, and I'm doing all that I can to deliver you. Join in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, he says, walk in him. So how did they receive Christ Jesus the Lord? How did they receive him? Anybody take a stab at it? By faith. How do we continue to walk in Jesus Christ? By faith. All right, you see that? So as you've received Jesus Christ the Lord, by faith. For by faith are you saved, all right? For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, even the faith and grace is the gift of God, all right? So walk ye in Him. You're rooted in Him, built up in Him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving for all that He's done for us. But Paul says, and we've looked at these verses in depth, beware lest any man spoil you. Spoil is the spoils of war. It's to take away his booty. The souls of men are spoils to people like Jim Jones, we hearken back a few years, and many other names that could be mentioned, where they control the minds of people. That's a spoil to them. You were lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Thinking about, uh, Kevin might remember, that group down in San Diego. There was a guy, remember that about... Heaven's Gate. Huh? Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate, yeah. What is it, about 20 or 30 of them all died in their room? Yeah. 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 That's Jim Jones, Heaven's Gate. There's thousands of them out there. There's many a Jim Jones in a pastorate today, but they don't have the personality. They don't have the uh, charisma to lead a group like that. But had they had the opportunity, it's down inside their heart to control the minds and hearts of men. Okay? I'm, I'm preaching to you in this series a tremendous liberty that you have in Christ Jesus. Some people call me authoritarian minister. Some people uh, have left the church and said, Pastor Warmark's nothing but a dictator. Well, that's just water off a duck's back to me because I know what I preach. I know what's in my heart. And I preach the glorious liberty that you have in Christ Jesus, and you're going to get a big dose of that Amen. today. Amen. Right? Amen. I also preach that all authority is bounded authority. And as we, as we stand up and say to the civil magistrate, your authority is bounded. You cannot, woe unto you for stealing from the people. Woe unto you for uh, decreeing unrighteousness, which you've decreed, as Isaiah chapter 10 says. So, too, the authority of a minister is bounded. The authority of a husband in a home is bounded. All authority is bounded except for Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and earth. So I just can't control your life willy-nilly, even though I'm a pastor with authority. My authority is bounded as well to the constraints of this book right here. All right. Now, verse 9, then Paul says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why I encourage you to have verse 3 and verse 9 underlined. In Jesus dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That is, God is doing a work of circumcision in our hearts, changing our hearts, not the foreskin of the flesh, putting off the body of sins by the flesh of the circumcision of Christ. We are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. We believe in the operation of God who raised 
of Jesus from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcised of your flesh, he's quickened. Quickened has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all the trespasses. Thank God for his forgiveness and forgiveness of trespasses. Then he blots out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. Some of you old timers, some of you that study things, uh, history, the blotter, there was ink on the page and you actually had a blotter and you would blot that out and it's gone. And so that's what he's saying here, that, that, that there was a, a record that was against us. It's blotted out in Christ Jesus. And you being dead in your sins and of circumcision, he's quickened you together and he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances which was against you. It was contrary and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus did all that for you and I so there's no record of guilt and wrong against us as we appropriate our faith in his blood and what he did on Calvary's cross for our sins. Amen. Amen. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. We talked about that. That is like a Roman victory march where, where a Roman uh, a leader, a, a general, would, would, would uh, take the king that he conquered or the nation and the, imagine those, uh, those civil officials and they'd walk through the streets of Rome and they would parade them. It was a great time of conquest and he would give gifts. And so Paul says... Jesus, after the resurrection, he's this great conqueror like a Roman general that you'll understand to the church at Ephesus, and he gave gifts to men. And the gifts that Christ gives, he says, as pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophets, all these working, these are gifts that Jesus Christ gives to the body to grow it and edify it thereby. So having taken principalities and powers, that's, that's the, the binding of Satan, Revelation chapter 19, Satan is bound. You say, well, Pastor, you believe Satan is bound? Why is it that he's doing so much destruction? Satan is bound, and the, and the apostle says that Satan's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's a lion that's got the teeth out of him. He can still roar pretty good, but his teeth have been taken from him, so his bite is not so bad. But the imagery here of, in Revelation 19 of Jesus' binding of Satan is, there's a chain. It says there's a chain and Satan is on this chain. If he's chained, how come he's doing so much destruction? Because it's as a dog on a chain. A dog is bound by a chain. But the chain is there and the dog can go 20 feet. The dog can go 30 feet. Maybe he can go 40 feet. Right. Or maybe he's on a runner, depending upon your imagery. But he cannot be free to do anything that he would. And Jesus bound Satan. I believe that Satan is bound now. And the, the gospel message is going forth and he only can go as far as the chain of Jesus Christ will let him go. And so he triumphs over them in it. Now, with this background, where we dealt a lot with these verses, uh, but with this just quick background, now we come to six, verse 16. Let no man therefore, we would say therefore let no man, but in this case Paul says, let no man therefore, with all this having gone on, because of all that you have, I have just written about, if you know who you are in Jesus Christ today, don't let anybody judge you. The modern vernacular here is, don't let anybody put a guilt trip on you. Don't let anybody put a guilt trip on you based upon these things that he's going to talk about, based upon a holy day or meat or drink or new moons or a Sabbath. Don't let anybody put a guilt trip on you over that. You're in Jesus Christ. You're blood washed. You're blood bought. Amen. You're called to be a saint. Don't let anybody judge you. So he says, in light of all this, of who Jesus is and who you are in Jesus Christ, let no man therefore judge you. And now he's going to give that, that judgment, put a guilt trip, condemn you, in regards to, and now he's going to tell what it's in regards to. In meat, the old English word there is food. Meat, in this case, you know, it could be beef or lamb or whatever. But, it, when, but meat is food in that old English term, not limited to just meat. So in meat or drink, or in respect of a holy day, how many know of particular religions in your mind where you can't drink certain things? No coffee, no tea, whatever, right? Okay. No alcohol. See? Don't let anybody judge you in those things. What you can't eat, can't have shrimp. Right? No shrimp on the barbie. Right? Don't let anybody judge you in regards to those things. Or of a holy day. We're going to talk about this. New moons or Sabbath days. To adopt these practices would not be Christian progress, but actually spiritual retrogression. 
You're going to go down. You're not going forward in Christ to adopt these practices, but you're actually going to go, your, your walk in the Lord is going to be hindered. And you become into what Paul says here at the end here, into a taste not handle not religion. Meat or drink, things that are clean or unclean. The Jews had a big background in this, and it was there for a reason, but Christ came to change their thinking. Open your Bibles, hold a hand in Colossians 2, and please go with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Jesus says, don't let anybody judge you now. Or Paul says, don't let anybody judge you in regards to meat, what you're eating, what you're drinking. Okay. So now we go to Mark chapter 7, and we see where Paul can base that from the teaching of Jesus Christ. So we'll pick up in verse 14. And when Jesus had called all the people unto him, <clears throat> he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. It's the things that come out of the man. So, for instance, when we look at the New World Order, we look at the United Nations, and uh, you got people like the Chuck Schumers of this world, and the Barbara Boxers, and Dianne Feinsteins, and the Barack Obamas, and the Joe Bidens, and they're trying to get rid of the handgun. You know, the, right in front of the United Nations in, in, uh, in uh, America is that big old statue of that handgun with the barrel twisted in the knot. 90% of you probably see this picture, all right? This is the evil. If we can get rid of the handgun, if we can get rid of the, you know, the assault weapons bill, and we can get rid of the assault weapon, then we'll have peace in the land and harmony. And Paul's saying, you know, a bunch of nonsense. What you eat is not going to do that. It's what's already in the heart of man. That's what defiles him. That's the old expression, guns don't kill people, people do. Hammers don't kill people, people do. So we, we understand that. But this is just Jesus teaching it flat out, right? So we understand that. So we don't get deceived or beguiled by those emotional appeals. By, some, by the way, just some good news. I, I just heard it, uh, maybe somebody else heard it. I just heard it yesterday. How many heard that Pierce Morgan was was, uh, was canned by CNN? Yeah. 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 Good news. Nobody was watching the show. Nobody. I guess the best, the, his best show ever was like still like less than 1% of the time. 25,000 people nationwide. He's gone. Let him go back to England, right? Yeah. Let him go back yeah. to Britain. Let's yeah. Nobody yeah. likes him. He's a Brit. Let's have it. Nobody's watching CNN. Nobody's watching CNN either, so they're, yeah, they're trying to do something. So anyway, good news, Pierce Morgan is going by Oz, we hope. All right. So anyway, so where are we at here about verse yeah, 15? There's nothing, see, entering in can defile this is what Jesus is talking about here. Those things which come out of him, it's in the heart of man to do wickedness. That's why we have to have a heart change, circumcision of the heart, as we just read about. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. What does this mean, Lord, what you're talking to us about? He saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do not you perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man and, not, and cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart. So basically, Christianity is a matter of the heart. The, in the Old Covenant, God said, Don't eat shrimp on the barbie. He said, Don't do some of these things, because he was working with them as... As, as children and the children of Israel, even though they were adults, he was trying to school them into a separation from the world. And it was for a time, these things were for a time so that Jesus could come and say, now I'm expanding on this. And he says, for instance, with adultery. Don't commit adultery physically, but here and now the Ten Commandments for a long time. But I say unto you, don't be lusting in your heart. Okay, So he's expanding into a greater maturity level. And so once we understand some of these basics, then I'm going to take you into a deeper level of heart matters and things of the heart. And he says, this is what is important. So now in verse uh, 18, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing goes enters into the man doesn't defile him? Because then there is not into his heart. Christianity is a religion of the heart. If you, as Shakespeare says, to thine own self be true, then as night follows day, thou canst be false to no man. We've got to be in our own hearts before ourselves true and true before the living God. So David would cry out many times, search my heart, try me, Lord, purge me. See if there be any wicked way in me. 
So we've got to not allow our hearts to be deceived. If we allow our hearts to be deceived, then we're deceived before God and before man. So he says it doesn't go into the heart, our innermost being, but it goes into the belly, our stomach, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And if you get some bad food, it messes you up for a time, and you get a lot of diarrhea, and that diarrhea is the draught, and eventually that food and that bad bug gets out of you. That's basically what he said. Verse 20, he said, That which cometh out of the man defileth the man. It's that which makes common or unclean. Now he says, I'm, I'm expanding you to understand Taking a pork is not making you unclean, right. but it's the heart, and we need a heart change, a continued heart change. Because there entereth, verse 19, because it entereth not into his heart, but goes into the belly, going into the draught, purging all meats. That which cometh out of the man, it's that which defiles him. For from within, here get this, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and defile the man. I was preaching, I'd just been preaching maybe uh, oh, maybe two or, two or three years in the ministry. I was a young man, a young preacher. I was preaching on something a guy didn't like. Um, I remember it really well on a Sunday night. And he was staring me down like to know him because I had said something in the message. I don't even remember what it was. But man, he didn't dig it. So I looked at him because he was he was he was trying to get to me and he was getting to me. So I, I are you giving me the evil eye? And I, and I went on. I just I you giving me and I went on and boy I set the church in an uproar. We were a corporation in those days, so the elders had to meet with because I said to this guy, Are you giving me an evil eye? And they come down on I me, mean, you can't talk that way to the church and blah 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 and so on. And, you know, my dad was behind me and but we had to get to the guy, and so we, we talked to the guy that I said that to, and he admitted I was he was. He said, Yeah, I was giving you the evil eye. I didn't like what you said. He said, I was giving you the evil eye. You know, dad knew, I didn't know about this verse at that time, it didn't you know register that people can give you the evil eye, an evil eye. And so when the elders he didn't dad didn't come against me, but a couple of elders did, they thought I was being too you know, abrupt and too harsh in church and so on and so forth, and they're long gone. They, they can go where, they're, where they can hear smooth things, all right? And frequently they can hear sermons yep. that are smooth. But if it came up, this guy was, he said, yeah, I was giving you the evil eye. So I had a right to say, are you giving me the evil eye? And rebuke him, you know, you shouldn't be giving the pastor the evil eye, and I shouldn't be giving you the evil eye. So anyway, so that comes from the heart of man. That's what Jesus said. These things come from the heart of man, and they defile him. That's what Jesus is saying. There. Okay, so let's go back now, if you would, please do. Uh, Colossians. Yeah, Colossians chapter 2, and we'll continue on here. So we're talking about, don't let people judge you in food and drink. Holy days. Don't let people judge you in reverence to holy days. These are the Jewish feasts. As I mentioned, they had a guy here that came to church for quite a while one day. He said he'd like to rent the church grounds. I said, well, you don't need to rent the church grounds. You're part of the church. And he says, I want to have a feast of booths or a feast of tabernacles. And we're going to camp out for a week. And you're going to live in a, uh, like a little hut that you make in your family. Because that's what they did in the Old Testament. And I said, well, you, now you can't have it for rent. You can't have it for free either. We're not going to go back to those Old Testament feasts. Because Jesus is my victory. Jesus is my trumpet. Jesus is my tabernacle. Jesus is my altar. Jesus is all things to us. We don't go back into those, as Paul says in another place, the weak and beggarly elements. They were for a time, God was schooling children for a time, so don't do this, don't do that, and that was all right. But now the substance, as Paul says, is Christ, so we're not going to do all those celebrations because Christ is our Pentecost. All right? He is our celebration. He is our life. So don't... And let any man judge you in reference to meat or drink or in respect of an holy day or of new moons. New moons, interesting. Open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 10 for just a quick second. Jeremiah chapter 10. Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10 verse 1 and 2. Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. This, be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens. Don't be disheartened. Don't lose courage. Don't base your faith upon 
a star, you know, a falling star or something like that, or a moon does something or the sun does something, don't get freaked out about it. How many have heard the uproar? Have you seen the discussion of the four blood moons? I actually want to see your hand. Yeah. How many have seen yeah. a, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? About ten of you have heard about the four blood moons. Well, you can type in the four blood moons in a word search on YouTube. Type in four blood moons, and you'll see a lot there. And there's a, a preacher, a very popular preacher in, in the Pentecostal charismatic realm from Texas, by the name of uh, John Hagee. He has uh, a church of, I think, about 20,000 people. Yeah. He influences wow. many, many people. And he's got a special, special message on the four blood moons. All right? And he's making all this signif signification about these four blood moons. And uh, I think Bart asked me the other day, a couple weeks ago, about it. So what do you think about the four blood moons? And then as I just started to talk to Bart, I could see the lights went on in Bart's, in Bart's countenance. And he said, yeah, I, I know what Bart Pastor's going to say. And I was glad that I didn't have to only say about a word or two. And Bart was already picking up. He knew where I was going to come from. A whole lot of hooey! Nonsense. going to add up to nothing. Amen. You see? And so he was getting it. So, how many, how many have heard of the Harbinger a couple years ago? The Harbinger. Oh, boy. The book of Isaiah. This guy's got the book of Isaiah down. And then you've got this tree that was planted in, uh, you know, in, in, in D, Washington, D.C. or Boston. I forget. And it's all there in the book of Isaiah. Folks, we can make the Bible virtually say anything by ripping verses out of their context. This is what the modern church has done for a long time. And it becomes to be a, a largely an acceptable practice. We rip verses out of their context, and then we can make the Bible say just about anything and everything that we want it to. This four blood moons is a lot of sensationalism. I, I may prepare a message on it and give it to you. I don't know. But anyway, it, 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 if you want to talk to me privately about it, it's going to add up to nothing. Just like the, you know, the year 2011 and the Mayan calendar and all this stuff. This is sensationalism that comes into the church, and people write books on it, and they become multimillionaires. I mean, th think of Tim LaHaye in the Left Behind series. Yeah. This guy's a multi, multi million si uh, on this sensationalism, which is a bunch of nothing, and has been. There should be good amen to that. I'm trying to protect you. Yeah. I'm your pastor, trying to protect you. Forget giving 25 bucks on a book that is going to do you no good. Go get the, go get the SAS Survival Manual from uh, uh, <laughs> Surplus and Survival. <laughs> Forget America's Providential History by Stephen McDowell. Oh, yes. you know, like yeah. that. That'll do you a lot of good. That'll stand the test of time. All right. So he says, don't let anybody judge you in reference to meat, drink, in reference to new moons. You have to pay attention to that stuff. Or Sabbath days, or Sabbath. What is, what is the Sabbath? Well, in, from, from a Hebraic and Old Testament perspective, it was from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday is how we would understand it, is how it's played out today. But you see, in the Old Testament, I just let me make a statement here. I can't spend a lot of time on it. I'll deliver another message on it here maybe shortly, I do every few years, because the Sabbath question comes up about Saturday. But let me just tell you, there's, there's no connection between Old Testament Sabbath keeping and the modern Saturday concept of worship. I'm just going to give you a quick example of that. In the Old Testament, your days began, the new year began on 14 Abib, Abib 14. That would be, that's either like April or May to us, all right? 14 Abib. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Hebrews had no concept of that. There was he ate Abib 1, Abib 14, Abib 15, uh, Nisan 1, 2, 3, 4. They had months and they had days. They didn't have, they didn't have days, they had dates. And so if the date is constant, the day will change. Let me give you a quick example of that. We celebrate Christmas every December 25th. Some of you, some of you don't, that's all right. But I celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Now, the date is constant. Therefore, what's going to happen to the day? Christmas was on a, what was it last year? Wednesday. Wednesday. So this year on 2014, it's probably going to be on a different day. If the date is constant, the day changes. So, can you have a Sabbath on a, on a Saturday? Yes, you can. But you'll have it on another day and another day and another day because the date is constant so the day changes. Just a little bit, I can go, I can go more in depth on that. If it's, if it's not clear to you, talk to me afterwards. I don't want to get bogged down. In. That's another message, but Sabbath. Some of you may not be aware, but the Seventh-day Adventists 
which were founded by Ellen G. White back in, uh, you know, 1850-ish. A lot of cults were founded, by, by the way, in that era. It's a fascinating thing. After the South lost the war, God began to spank the North by bringing in all these cults. They're all birthed in around 815 to 8, 1850 to 1890. Very fascinating. The four major cults in America today, they're all birthed in that time period. All right? So, anyway, Ellen G. White had got a revelation in circa 19, 1850. And she said, and they observed the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was the holy day. God showed her, uh, somebody may not know the story, a light. She was reading the Ten Commandments, and a light came and, sh and shone on, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Right? So we remember that. So, oh boy, we got to do it. And so, matter of fact, I heard somebody just recently just say, holy Sabbath. We got to hold, and, and they, they, this person was taught, holy Sabbath, not the Sabbath, holy Sabbath. Okay. So, she got this revelation, 6 p.m., Friday to 6 p.m. Saturday, that's the Sabbath. That's going to bring restore the church, bring us back into good favor with the Lord. The problem is she began to do some more research in the Bible, and she saw that the uh, 6 p.m. thing was not in the Bible, right? So she had to get another revelation. And the revelation was, as she read the Word of God, that the Sabbath would now be Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. You follow that? This is a true story. You can look it up. It's not, it's not hidden, hidden knowledge. So now, she wants to be more biblical in her interview, so she changes it. God showed her that Sabbath is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. The problem was, you had a lot of followers that heard, Thus saith the Lord, the Sabbath is from 6 p.m. Friday to Saturday 6 p.m. And that was, Thus saith the Lord. So it actually split the denomination, because which, which revelation are you going to believe of Ellen G. White? All right? This stuff, this is the stuff that Paul's saying we're getting rid of this sort of thing. Don't let anybody judge you. Don't let anybody put a guilt trip on you over these things. Yeah. Your father would say, when he would talk to some dad, he said, you know, they go back and forth. And he said, you know, instead of being a seventh day Adventist, why don't you try being a seven day Adventist? <laughs> Very good. Seven day Adventist. Very good, Kevin. Excellent point. Uh, because Paul says, some of us in Christianity esteem every day alike. We don't have to worship on Sunday. How many of you know that? The, 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 historically, we've done so to honor the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I think it's a good thing, and it's, it's a right thing. But it is not a have-to thing. We don't have to worship on Sunday. The nation's built around that. In the Constitution, you know, it mentions about that. That day is, you know, you don't do business on that day. And I think that's a good and healthy thing. But what Kevin's saying is, my dad, you what Paul said, he, my dad would tell you, he was one that esteems every day alike. But it's healthy for the nation to choose a day and that we honor the Lord, I, no problem. But it's not a have-to thing. All right. So he says, don't let people judge you meat, drink, respect to holy days, new moons, or Sabbath days. Then he says in verse 17, which are a shadow, shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ, a shadow. Many try to make salvation out of the shadow. I'm not trying to pick on some day today, I haven't mentioned them for a long time. But if you talk to them, salvation is really hinged upon the holy day. Many people try to make salvation out of the shadow Rather than salvation in the body, as Paul says here, which is Christ. It's the following this particular ritual, or this particular formula, or this particular new moon, or whatever it happens to be. It says these things are a shadow, but the body is Christ. Why would anybody embrace a shadow religion? It's easy. Yeah, because it appeals to our flesh. Makes people feel special, too. Yeah. They, they don't come okay. There's a lot of reasons. You guys have got a lot of reasons. That's exactly right. We embrace, but in, in its essence, we embrace the shadow religion because it appeals to our flesh, to our ego. Something that we're doing to merit eternal life rather than just simply casting ourselves upon Jesus Christ. Literally casting ourselves physically and spiritually at will. Now, so then he says in verse 18, Now, because the body, the substance, is Jesus Christ. So I got this guy mad at me when he wanted to rent the church facilities to do these Old Testament feasts. I said, no, I have, I have the substance. I don't need the types and shadows. 
and the substance in Jesus Christ. Let no, verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let no man beguile you. The thought there is, don't let anybody rob you. The imagery here is of, of according to the comments, the scholars, the imagery here is of a bad umpire's decision against you. You're running in the race, and the umpire makes a bad decision and disqualifies you, but you don't allow a bad decision or someone to rob you of your reward and your faith and simplicity in Christ Jesus. Paul said, remember, he said in one place, he said to Corinthians, I have a fear. Paul said, I have a fear. We're not supposed to fear. He said, I have a fear. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his <coughs> subtlety, so that your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ Jesus. There is a depth in Christ Jesus, but there's also a simplicity as it pertains to eternal life. The best illustration of that is a famous evangelist many, many years ago was given an invitation. Come to Christ. Come to Him. Let Him forgive you of your sins. Let Him wash away your sins. Cast yourself upon His mercy. And as this evangelist gave this invitation, on one side was a 12-year-old mental retarded boy. He was mentally retarded. He came down on, to the altar. On the other side of the altar was an atomic physicist. Both understood the message, the gospel of salvation, the simplicity which is in Christ Jesus. Whosoever will, let him come. This voluntary humility, Paul says, will anybody rob you, beguile you, deceive you of your reward in a voluntary humility? Humility. This is a superficial piety. <coughs> worshiping of angels. Voluntary humility, worshiping of angels. Some in Paul's day were saying, because, because God is so high and mighty and so holy, we can't have direct access to Him, so we must use the help of angels and petition them. How many of you see there's a resurgence in angelology and angelology yeah. just in the last two years or so? It's a cycle. It comes around. Uh, that was big in the, I don't know, 70s, somewhere in there. It'll come around every 20, 30 years. Because people forget, somebody writes a new book, makes a lot of money on this mm -hmm. stuff, and then everybody starts getting on the angel bandwagon. Okay? You know, we know angels are ministering spirits. There are some scriptures on it, but we have to leave it at that. There's much we don't know. But the person who has, uh, has a false humility and pride, he becomes the specialist on angels. And it happens within the kingdom of God. You've got people that, that, that their ministry, they specialize on angelology, angelology or something like that. In Christ, the path to God is open to the humblest and least esteemed person. So we don't need to have angels as go-betweens or go-befores for us. It's very similar to the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mariolatry. And that is because Jesus is so high and so holy, if we really want to get to his heart, we go through the mother. Because Jesus can't, because Jesus really can't resist his mother. Because he's Jesus' mother. He's a good Jewish boy. And so if we really want to get our petition answered, we go to Mary, who has an in with Jesus. So we give our petition to Mary. And this is honestly how they think. I'm not trying to make fun in that sense. That Mary's got a better chance of getting our petition through, so we appeal to Mary in that regard. Yes? Where do they find that anywhere in the scriptures? You don't find it in the scriptures. You, you find, of course, you, you find at the marriage of Cana where, where Mary says about the turning the water to wine, what he tells you to do, do it. And so you just see a little bit of instruction there with Jesus. It, it, and it's just mainly tradition, yeah. large tradition. But they'll try and pull something out. But this is the problem with traditions of men and women rather than relying upon the word of God. Entreating. Now let me read verse 18 to you again into a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, mainly pump, puffed up by his fleshly mind. This is going outside the revealed word of God to teach deeper teachings, deeper truths. I think of a guy on the, uh, on the internet and radio, his whole ministry is talking about angels, talking about the nephilim, talking about Bible codes, talking about astrology, all kinds of stuff. He has the secret, and you go to him, and he's studying all this, all this weird stuff. And in the end, it all adds up to a bunch of nothing, folks. In the end, it adds up to nothing. Bible codes, pyramidology, astrology, shadow people, lizard people, all this stuff. And, and he's an authority on these things. 
I'm telling you, it adds up to nothing, and it's just it's a way for him to make a living. And he looks like he's this really knowledgeable guy. But when we get outside of Jesus Christ, our knowledge is putrefaction. It's nothing. Because in Jesus Christ are hit all the ways, all the, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Jesus Christ. Some men make their living off this stuff. And it gets to where the rubber meets the road. They really know nothing, but it appeals to them, and they stand out as authorities in these areas. Paul says, don't let anybody rob you with this kind of stuff. Verse 19. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. In other words, it's the head. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. As the modern chorus says, for Ed's benefit, benefit, I'm getting back to the heart of worship. Yeah. It's all about you, Jesus. Been out a few years now, but uh, anyway, I'm getting back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, Jesus. It all comes back to Christ. Our nourishment, our growth as a body, all these things are, are being knit together in unity. It's found in Jesus Christ, not in a particular belief about the Nephilim or whatever. Now that's important, because we, let me just take it aside here that I didn't plan to do, because we're winding down anyway. What knits us together at, at the Church of Korea, and I'm very careful, as best of my ability, folks, as the best of my ability, and those listening by the internet, what unites us at the Church of Korea is the preeminence of Jesus Christ into all things. We can differ on eschatology, we can differ on a lot of different things at the Church of Korea, and still be brothers in the Lord. But our uniting has to be that Jesus Christ is Lord. Our uniting has to be that uh, there is no other way to the Father but through Him. And so we want to put an extreme emphasis on Jesus as all in all. The work that Jesus did on Calvary's cross for you and I. All right? This is what has to unite us. That Jesus Christ is Lord in every area of life. Now, let's look at verse 20 to 23. I'm going to read them together because they're... They're a closing thought here. It's, a, it's Paul's distilling of the elements of what he's been talking about in the first two chapters. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, the elements, the, the worldly natural elements, if you be dead with Christ to the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to these ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. We call it closed line religion. Do this, don't do that which are all to perish with the using. Another place in Hebrews, Paul calls them the car carnal, as in flesh and carnal ordinances, which are all to perish with after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in real worship. First blush, it looks like humility, neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Yeah. So let's kind of go through this just real quickly. First, what Paul seems to be saying here is, why go back to Jewish legalism and abandon Christian liberty? Right. Why go back to Jewish liberty, or Jewish legalism, and abandon Christian liberty? Yet that's what many people would ask us to do. We meet them from time to time. Now, liberty in Jesus Christ is not licensed to do whatever we please, but be free from the enslavement of sin. Jesus Christ came to deliver men and women. The book of Hebrews says Jesus Christ came to deliver those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through fear of death. Many people within the church world are even subject to that fear. They haven't released it to Jesus Christ. That's why you saw, those of you that have been here for a while at the Church of Quia, you saw when my dad's time came to go and leave, shuffle off this mortal coil, and my mom's time, both of them only lasted about two and a half weeks. Because they were prepared to release themselves into the hands of Jesus Christ and say, don't keep me here. Matter of fact, now, our family is ripped apart over this. My physical family. Because mom and dad don't, no, no, I don't want any of these, you know, extreme, uh, what do they call it? Extraordinary. Uh, thank you, extraordinary measures. I don't want them. I don't want extraordinary measures. Both of them. Let me die at home. They're both request. Die at home, which they did, which we honored for them. So people can't handle that, even within the church world. Some people can't handle that right. in the church world. Well, they can sing songs about heaven, and they want to go over to the over, mansion over yonder, but when they get to the edge, when they get to the precipice, keep me here, Lord, as long as I can. Keep me here. Keep me here. 
Do whatever it takes. My bags are packed. Yeah, yeah. Fred's bags are packed. He's got his house in order, his spiritual house. Ready to go. All right. Now, liberty in Jesus Christ is not licensed to do whatever we please, but to be free from the enslavement of sin. Now, let me just give you a word as we, we've only got a few thoughts here on liberty of conscience. This is a doctrine. It's like we have various doctrines, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of life, whatever. We have the doctrine of liberty of conscience. Hold your hand in Colossians chapter 2 and go to Romans chapter 14. And I want you to see that. So we'll go back a few books. Romans chapter 14. This whole chapter is people, and you know, uh, well, actually, let's read uh, verse 5 of chapter 14, because Kevin hit on that. Romans 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he regardeth it. He that eateth and eateth to the Lord, he that gives thanks and he that eateth. That's just another chapter about don't get hung up in this kind of stuff. Paul's saying don't get hung up in these types of things, all right? Those that are it's called known as being weak in the faith there in verse 1 and 2. I want to get to Romans 14, 22 and 23. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Now this is for talking about liberty of conscience and a heart matter. Christianity is a heart matter. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you can't eat pork, and if your heart is pricked by the fact that you just had a big, well, we're having bacon and sausage, aren't we? <laughs> Amen. All right, we're having bacon and sausage in about 20 minutes here. If you can't eat it, nobody's going to try and make you, or nobody's going to look down on you for eating, for not eating it. Right. You can't eat it because if you can't eat it, I can eat this morning uh, bacon and sausage in faith. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it for him day before the face of God. If you're unable to do that, Paul says, that's all right. You know, if he talks about eating herbs there, you can only eat herbs, that's fine. Just don't make everybody else eat herbs if that's all that you can do. And I won't make you eat. I'm not going to try and force anybody. I'm not going to force feed anybody here. Bacon or sausage this morning. But the thought is here is before God in your heart, if you can do this thing, then you can do it in serving the Lord. If you cannot do it, then stay away from it. For whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, we're in Romans, we're going to go over to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians. So we're about 15, 20 pages here to Galatians chapter 5. And we'll look at this again. Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 1, Therefore, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Mm -hmm. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. The problem in the church in Galatia was the Judaizers were saying, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, yeah, he's a great guy, but you've got to get circumcised in the flesh as well to be a true Jew. Paul saying to them, no, don't let those guys deceive you, don't let it happen. Anybody in wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 3, for I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. If you want to make circumcision a part of your faith, physical circumcision. Now you can do it because it's for hygienic reasons. You can do it for whatever reason you want to do, and many people do for hygienic reasons. They get circumcised or circumcise their kids. But if you're doing it because you're trying to get closer to God and be a, make it part of your covenant with God, and Paul says, all right, then you're going to have to do the whole law, and you're a debtor to the whole law, and you're going to find yourself in trouble. You're not going to be able to make it. So we come back to Christ. Come back to Christ. Now let's close. Chapter, back to verse 20 and 22 here. So he says, Why are you subject to the ordinances? Verse 20. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Which are all to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men. They perish with the using because they are of human origin. They're not of divine origin. So they don't, 
will stand the test of time. If man makes the rules also, man can and will change those rules. If man makes the rules, man can and will change those rules. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said, But in vain do they worship me, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is the Judaizers that added to the law of God. I am in no way today condemning the Old Testament or making light of or making fun of the Old Testament. I'm trying to explain that they were there for a time. It was a growth process. For instance, when our children are two years old, we tell them, don't go out on the street. Now, I don't need to give a big dissertation. Now, don't go out on the street because, you know, the cars go by fast. You might get splatted in the pyre might matter. might fly up onto the windshield of the car. But I don't need to get into all those things. Don't go out on the street because mom and dad said so. And some of the Old Testament is because God said so. So they simply were obeying as they were walking in the maturity level. But after a maturity time, they're getting a little bit older, then sometimes some explanation is in order of why we do what we do or why we don't do what we do. But as they're working through these, God just said in some places, just don't do it. You want the explanation? As you mature, I'll give you more understanding. So, these things are to perish after the commandments and doctrines of men, which indeed have a show of wisdom and will worship. They're self-imposed ordinances that gratify the flesh while seeming to mortify it. That's very important. Sometimes we, it looks like we're mortifying the flesh, but actually we're gratifying it. Some of the things of those that are very aesthetic in their religious practices, sometimes that's actually what is going on there. Neglecting the body, not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, Paul says in summing it up, all these things that, the men, that man attempts to do that aren't God-ordained, puts his pride on display, but do not honor God. We honor God by committing everything that we have to Jesus Christ. We honor Jesus Christ by saying, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And everything that we have is found in Him. And that our victory in our walk is found in what He did on Calvary's cross for our sin. Not by doing this or not doing that. That's a taste not handle about religion. But our victory, our life, is found in knowing Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for these folks here today. I thank you for your word. Lord, I, I'm preaching liberty to these folks today. I pray that they would not use that liberty as a license, Lord, to sin in a willful sense. But they'll use that liberty to walk freely in you and the glorious liberty as sons and daughters of you. So bless this, your people. Now I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.